and that's the span element. And if we then uh, run D3 select all on this P span uh, parent child relationship, uh, we can uh, see the output. It's of course only going to select elements um, like the span within the P, so this one here, even if I were to um, um, like color. Uh, so there's nothing here to select, and so therefore it's just selecting those. Um, and if I had a span, for example, on the other level here, this also won't be selected, of course. Okay, um, so here is a, like if we, if we were to um, look at the console and like look at the data structure here of the selection, um, this is what we would see. Like you shouldn't really like have to directly use this because all of this is documented or accessible through, uh, through API functions, but it's still good to have an understanding of what the data structure that D3 uses behind the scenes is because it will simply let you debug your code easily. So like the selections, um, they have multiple, like this is an object selection and it has multiple groups or multiple like of these um, multiple of these, let's say, um, uh, lower level objects. And so in here, we only see the update selection. So this lower, the, the, the source selection, which is um, within the underscore groups. And so if we open up the node list within the groups, we can see the three span elements that match, that map to this one, two, three here. Um, okay, so when we want to map data to that, we have the data join function. So here is basically uh, a simple SVG, like this is what it looks like. And then when I click, I'm mapping data elements on it. So, um, and of course, this, this again, uh, the SVG is convenient here, but I could also make, uh, like set the width of a diff and the color of a diff and so on. So it doesn't have to be SVG. Um, so what we have here is like we initialize the SVG, we see three rectangles. Um, and then here, um, we look at, we, we define a data set. Um, so selection of data, this is the data join method where we bind the data to the selection. So here we have selected all of the rectangles and here by calling this data uh, we bind all of the data. And so then we have like, let's look at what the output of this is from um, 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 on the console. So this is the original selection here. Um, we have again the groups with the node list and the rectangles. And then down here, well it actually happened here too, uh, but then we have it assigned the data elements. So if we look here, we can see this is, oh, it's maybe a little hard to read. Uh, if we look here, we can see that the data is mapped to the rectangle here. So if we hover over this rectangle, it will be highlighted and we we'll see the, the joint data uh, item here. Okay, and so what we do here then is we take this data um, and apply and use the data when we draw. Um, so here the y position is just done purely based on index, uh, but the width of these rectangles is defined as a function of d, and this is just like a returning d here. Um, and so this is just like some, some other styling, and then we get this chart. Okay. Um, <coughs> What is interesting about this is uh, when we have done a data join, we also get um, the enter and the exit uh, selections that you can see here. So here we have the update selection, which in this case is populated, but we also have the enter and the exit selections. And so we talked about um, how to use these enter and exit selections last time, but here is like a chart that illustrates the, these relationships, and this is really important that you properly understand. So like enter is um, for all the, um, elements that are in the data, but we don't have the previous match in the DOM. So this is essentially like everything that is new. Uh, the update selection is the, um, wherever the data matches to existing DOM elements. And the exit selection is wherever um, the, like DOM elements are in the, uh, there were DOM elements that don't match to a data set. So we have to treat these three separately. So usually we want to remove the exit selection, we might want to update the update selection, and we have to add stuff to the enter selection. 
Okay, um, so let's take a look at what happens if we start with an empty rect uh, with an empty canvas, and then suddenly we want to create um, uh, a chart like this. Um, so we have we start like as I said the SVT here is empty. Um, we again select on non-existing elements. This is this non-intuitive um, aspect of it, where you select on non-existing elements, and you should always select on. Uh, the element that you actually want to select on, so in this case the rectangles. Here we are doing the data join, um, and then uh, on enter, uh, we can uh, we retrieve only the enter selection. So now we have the elements that are only in the enter selection, so in this, in this variable. Um, and now we can append rectangles to this enter selection, and again, we use this declarative approach where we don't have to loop anything, but simply what we do here is apply to all of the elements uh, in the answer selection. Um, and then we can see the rectangles which, uh, as they are assigned to the selection. So, like, interesting here is to um, understand what happens after the enter before I did an append. Um, and so, in the data structure we see that we have these enter nodes. These are not proper DOM elements, but they are they're placeholder elements, essentially. But they already have the data assigned here. And only when I do the append and use the actual DOM element, the enter node will be replaced with the actual DOM element. Um, so in this case, what will happen if I take this code here for a rectangle in SVG and paste it in here? So what happens if I click run now? How are they going to look? I assume they're going to look like they did before. So three blue rectangles with properly data mapped? I think so. <laughs> no. Cool. Yep. You can have four rectangles and have the one that you just manually put in and then the three if you use enter will match three new ones that will match the um, uh, no, because we were like what I'm selecting on is, is this rectangle. So this would be this would go into the update selection. Like if you look here, like I have an existing element, and therefore this gray rectangle would be in the update selection, and then the two additional data elements here would be in the enter selection. Oh, okay. so there's not a method called like update that will select the existing? One? Uh, that is the default. So like whenever I call select, uh, I select everything that matches this CSS um, selector, and that is then the being updated. Uh, what's that? So like you, when you call select, do you try to select one that exists already? Yep. And if you have any extra data, you'll make new ones? Exactly. And so that's, this is the differentiation between the update and the, and the enter selection. Is there a way to like, say I, I only want to select existing ones or I only want to... Uh, well, uh, sure, you can only operate on the enter selection. So everything you do, like we have explicit handles for each of those. And you can say, only do this to the update selection, only do this to the enter selection, and only do this to the exit selection. So if I don't do anything with the enter selection, I'm only going to work with those that are existing, that are already in the DOM. If I only work with those that are in the enter selection, I'm only um, changing the new elements, and I'm not changing any updated elements. Like, um, we had the, well, yep. So, I assume in this scenario, we're going to have the three blue ones and the gray ones. No. That you no, no, because just two blue ones. Two blue ones and one gray one, yeah. So let's run it. Um, and so the reason because here is um, we have like this is part of the update selection, but here we are only like here I'm calling like I'm assigning this variable to the enter selection. So I'm, I'm taking only this chunk here of the Venn diagram and I'm taking those and all of the styling that I do and the mapping based on the data, I'm only doing it on the enter selection. So I'm not, I'm not changing the updated elements. The selection, like there is, uh, like here, um, what I have here, like if I did that here, um, I would only operate on the update selection. So the data here contains the update selection. Um, if I were, for example, to map the data here, I would like uh, only um, create blue rectangles for those that already exist. But I have examples following that. So any questions about this, why this happens like that? Because this is like the one thing that is really important to understand in D3. I have a question about 
the good practice you mentioned that it's not good to select something that is kind yep. of like uh, yep. So what do you do? Like what is the good practice? The good practice is to let's like, say typically I'm not gonna select on a rectangle, right? Um, this is just for simple examples. So I'm gonna select for my data bar class. So I have rectangles and I assign them to a class which is called dot data bar. Um, and so I would select here if I have an empty canvas on dot data bar and then every rectangles that I create, I would assign them to the class data bar. So if I have an update, it would automatically match. Like if I, I can then use the same, like usually what I do, and we'll see that later today, um, I'm not writing this code once, but I'm writing the same code so that I can reuse it for enter, update, and so on. And so then I'm flexible. Like if I do this correctly, if I use the, uh, the right class uh, specifier or the right CSS selector here, um, then I can always reuse the same function to map, to select the right elements. And so in this case, rectangle is the simplest form, but what I really would want to do is um, some class specifier. Okay. Um, so, um, now let's take a look at the, um, how we can handle these updates correctly. So what we want, to, what we have here is we start with, with nothing, and I click run, and I have a data set with five items, and then I click on next data set, and the next data set only has three items, but they're different. Um, so like this is gonna change to the next data set, and if I click run again, um, it changes back to the original data set and next data set. And so you can see the data set's defined here, this is the next data set, um, and here is the original data set um, that are applied. And so as you could, so you could see, I am properly switching out all of the elements here. Okay, so let's take a look at what happens. And so here is exactly what I, what I, what I mentioned just earlier. I'm not selecting on rectangles anymore, but I'm actually selecting on a class.bars. Um, so that's usually how you would really do it. Um, then I'm applying, um, like I'm doing the data join. I'm, I'm applying my data to the a selection here. Now first I handle everything that is about to be removed. So if I switch from the six, uh, from the six data set here through to the three data set, uh, through the three item data set down here, I have three elements in this exit selection. Um, so I'm calling exit.remove and now this is just going to be removed. Um, then we handle new elements. And so here we, we retrieve these new elements, the enter selection, by calling bars.enter.append rectangles. So here we add the rectangles to the DOM. We don't say anything about uh, how they look, where they position, and so on. They're just added to the DOM. Um, and here we also define the class. So we could even say attribute class is that uh, um, is bars, but we can also say class bars true. So these are just two different ways of defining classes. So each of these rectangles that I'm appending here, they have no styling information, but they are rectangle and they have a class that is bars. And so therefore, whenever I go back, this is going to match this selector here. Um, and then here in this step, I'm merging the enter and the exit selection. So these are uh, the enter, sorry, the enter and the update selection. I'm not merging the exit selection. So these, like these, are now all of the elements that are supposed to be drawn in the next step. And so then we can take those together and jointly handle them in, in terms of styling. So now we say, okay, position it in X, position it in Y. Y is again a function just of the index, uh, not of the data. Um, and then set the width to, uh, to a data-driven attribute, to D, uh, the height, the fill, and the opacity. Um, and so now, like if we rerun this, we start with nothing, we create a proper enter, we, um, we do the proper styling based on the merge selection, and we have a proper um, exit and a proper update. Okay, any questions about this? Can you go over what the exit statement is doing again? Sure. Uh, the exit statement here, like if you look at this, um, let's say like you have now, let's assume we have um, six, uh, six rectangles in our, in our DOM, right? Um, and we're applying here in the my data is not the six six um, is not the six data items, but it's only the three data items that I have down here, right? Um, and so in this case, I have six rectangles, but only three data elements. Um, so I have three data elements that are just floating around. 
And so um, if I were to remove this, what would happen? Now I have the six. And if I click next data set, the three here stay. Um, so if I don't explicitly remove those elements that don't have a data match anymore, uh, then they simply stay on the canvas. Um, so like if I click now and run, you see that the first three update correctly, uh, but they are not, th these elements, that they shouldn't be here when I click on next data set, but they're still here because it didn't properly handle the exit selection. So you haven't had to do anything to tell it which rectangles should be in the exit selection, it's automatically choosing them? Um, yes, so it's choosing them based on the order um, in, the, in the data set. Um, and so we will learn at the end, like if, if this data were associated with some, um, some key, we'll learn on how to pass a specific key function to identify which rectangle actually to remove. But for now, it's just taking the first three, matching them to the new data set, uh, and removing the rest of them. <coughs> Okay, um, and so remember that the, this is one of the new things in D3 version 4, that you have to use an, an explicit merge to merge the um, enter and the update selection, which you didn't have to do before. Um, okay, um, so then, like you saw, these were a couple of hard switches, uh, but what we now want to do is we want to be able to do uh, something like this. Like take data items that already or take anything that already exists on the canvas, uh, morph it, map it to the data, and dynamically fade it in and position it correctly. And then if I switch to another data set, I want to dynamically change the size and fade out the other ones. And so this is what I can do with transitions. Um, so here I start out with one single rectangle here, um, just to to show you guys that uh, that we're handling everything correctly in terms of update and enter and so on. Um, we again have the same data sets. Um, we again select on the same bars. Um, and so here, what is only, like the only thing that is interesting here is that when we do the append, uh, when we operate on the enter selection to create new rectangles, we create those rectangles with the width of zero and with opacity zero. So they're, they have no width and they have like no opacity. So therefore we don't really see them, only if we only did this. Uh, but they, of course, they exist in the DOM. They're just not visible. Um, here, we handle the exit selection. So we say, like, everything that is in the exit selection starts out with opacity 1. Then we transition for a duration of 3 seconds. And at the end of this uh, transition, we should have opacity 0. So this is this effect that we saw. Um, if we click now on next data set, those three elements here at the bottom, like if you look closely, they're simply fading out. And this is what we do uh, with this exit selection and the transition here. Um, here again, we merge the enter and the update selection. And then here is what we do with the updates. Like here, what we did earlier, just with styling the width and the blue, uh, and assigning the blue color, um, here we do it smoothly. So we take whatever we have, um, and say, transition it for three seconds, um, set x to zero, set y to this like, uh, index dependent function, uh, set the width to d, um, and so we start it out before, but when, when there's new elements coming in, they have a width of zero, and after this transition, they have a width of d, right? And so what then uh, d3 does is a linear interpolation between those two states, and this is the nice animation that you see here. Um, I am also fading them in, like you see opacity 1, and I am also, like, they start out as gray bars, but then I'm fading them in steel blue. So D3 does an interpolation of the color, of the opacity, of the position, and of the width, or of the other properties of the elements. Can we see the event program? Sure. So here, x is 0, y is, the, the y position is correct. Um, I could also do this here. Um, width is zero, uh, height is 20, uh, style is uh, like opacity is zero. And so in this case here, this will fade in from the top. Do you need to um, repeat whatever you had previously, or can you just include um, the changing attributes for the transition function? Um, you don't need to. For example, 
Yep. Your height stays the same, your x stays the same. Correct. That should work. Yep. So like another example here is I probably wouldn't need this um, the style operation operation here. So that should work fine. Yeah, so you don't need to repeat those. Okay, um, any questions about those transitions? Okay, great. So um, this is like pretty powerful, but one thing that we very often want to do is we don't just render these bars as rectangles in an SUG. In a real life scenario, we usually have some labels that we want to show, we have some other elements that are associated with it, uh, for example, elements that we, that we use for selections and so on. Um, so what we want to do is we want to have, for example, if we wanted to have tick mark or labels on these bars that says like 200 here, um, there's two ways we could do that, right? So we could either take the 200 and position it manually, again, still based on data, but completely treat, um, treat the bar and the text separately, and just by, by smartly positioning them based on the data, uh, we could make it appear as if this were labeled. Uh, the other way of doing this is by creating a larger structure, a group, that contains both the text and the bar. Um, and that is of course convenient because then I can have to only, like the joint attributes of these, of these groups, like the Y position, I only have to set it once. Um, and so that is one way of handling such nested elements. And so here is an example, like there's two different examples that I have for that. One of them is kind of like how you would write it intuitively, um, and then we have to look at what, what goes wrong. So this example here is broken, uh, but the basics, like the, what is broken here is the transitions. Um, so here the data doesn't update, uh, but the basics here work. So if we look at this, what we want to create We want to create this, this grouping structure here. So like here we have a bar group. Um, and within that bar group we have a rectangle and then we have a, a text element. And so those two, uh, you can see that they are like here, they are translated together. So that I don't have to manually specify the Y positions of the bar or the label within the group because the group is taking care of that for me. Um, so here we see that there is no, um, no explicit um, Y transformation for the text or for the, um, or for the rectangle. Okay, so how do we create this? Um, we again have very similar beginnings. Uh, we select on, in this case, the bar group and not on the bars themselves. Um, and so now for the enter selections, we append a grouping, a group element and we assign it the class bar group. Remove all of the bar groups that don't exist anymore, so that works fine. Um, and then here we merge again um, the enter and exit selections. And so what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm transforming them based like the group itself. I'm, I'm transforming them to the correct Y position. So the whole group, which will contain both the rectangle and the text, is, um, is moved to the correct Y position. And then I take the enter bar groups, like these groups, and append a rectangle. Again, declarative, I'm doing this only once, it's done to all of the elements that are in the selection. Um, I assign a width to these rectangles, I assign a height to these rectangles, I assign a color to these rectangles. Then I append the text, and so the text, I'm uh, putting it, I'm translating it to the right of the bar. So what I do is I take D, add five pixels for spacing, um, and this is how much I move over on the text, so that we get these like nice labels, five pixels left, uh, five pixels right of the bars. Um, we assign like the text in this case um, of the text label is the data, which is just a number. Um, and here we, we just assign that um, position that it's centered in the middle. Um, okay, so this is what how that works. And so. Can anybody tell me why the update doesn't work? So if you look closely here, I did the merge, but I don't really use the, 
um, I don't really use the um, uh, the merge anymore. I am from here on out. I'm operating on the enter selection, um, and so the enter selection uh, that is great because here the D is defined. Uh, but like we we need a special way of like selecting existing rectangles that are part of the group, um, that are part of the group to actually map them to the data. And so one of the problems that we would have if we did that is that. If we look at the group element here, like this is essentially, I'm just printing the data structure here after an update. And if we look at the G element here, it is correctly updated to the element, like to 100 uh, in this case, as you can see up here. But the nested rectangle here, the data was not correctly updated. Um, so we have the old, uh, we have the old data item in here. And so not, this is not like when I apply a new data set to a nested structure, it's only applied to the top level element. It's not that automatically propagated down to all of its children. And so this is the problem why we don't get um, these proper updates. So how can we fix that? Uh, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, we have to simply, um, like we take care of the enter properly. We create um, a G element. We assign it a class. We remove it as we did before. Then here again on the enter selection, we append the rectangles, but we essentially <coughs> only do only like these dummy assignments with with zero height uh, and, and style gray, um, and then we also append the text, but we don't do anything to the text at this point. We simply say, okay, add the field, but don't worry about what what's going on. Next, we merge the enter and the update selection, which we now hold in the bar groups uh, variable here, um, and then here is the trick. Um, if we then select on a rectangle, the data is propagated down to the rectangle. And so there's other ways of doing this, but this is like the most convenient way because I also need to update that rectangle, right? So I need to somehow get a hold, like here I'm having a mix of update and uh, enter elements, and so I need to get a, get a hold of all of these rectangles and do something to them. Uh, and so the, the easiest way is of running another select operation on, uh, on the group. And by running the select operation, the data is down propagated to the rectangle and also to the, to the text. And so here I'm doing what we've always done. Um, I'm applying a transition, uh, dynamically fitting in the width, dynamically changing the color, dynamically changing the opacity, um, and also for the text, uh, I am fading it in from opacity zero um, with a delay of two seconds. So it's only supposed to start appearing when the bars are already somewhere there, um, and assign it a value based on the data, um, and then um, position it here again based on the data. And so when we do that, we get a properly working example. In this case, it's also fading in, so you can see the labels. And then if I click next data set, the labels first disappear, <coughs> the bars change their width, um, and then the labels reappear again. Um, you could, but it would be pretty hacky. Uh, you could, like, you have DOM elements, and the DOM elements always have a reference to their parents. And so you could go in, write a function here, where you would retrieve, like, if you did that, here you could uh, retrieve the, uh, the parent first, and then take the data item out of the parent. That is possible. But um, itself doesn't have a function where we can No, because it's, it's ugly. Um, and you make assumptions about how your code, like how your DOM is structured and so on. So the, this is the variation that by, by propagating the DDOM via selection is way more elegant. How does the, like how does the propagation work? So, because like you didn't call the data function on the... No, the, the propagation is, is, this is like a little bit not super elegant. Uh, by calling the select, um, the data is propagated. So uh, from, the, from the element that you call the select based on. Okay. And that is just like an implementation query, which is more or less a convenience. You can also explicitly, I don't remember the exact syntax, but you can also explicitly try to trigger this down propagation. Okay, but calling select from yep. a parent transfers the data down. Exactly. Okay. 
So if there were multiple rectangles in a group and you did select all rect, would all of them get the one data point? Or uh, yes. Okay. What you do with those is then up to you, right? If you have multiple rectangles, then you probably want to do something different. Uh, but all of them would get this, um, like in this case, everything that matches the CSS selector. So like, you could do, like if you have multiple rectangles that do something different, you would probably not use rectangle here, but you would, you would use a class. Um, and so here the same applies for text. So um, this is just, this is doesn't do like, um, the selection only propagates down for what you select on and not for everything that is uh, a child of the group. Um, so you have to do it explicitly for select and text. Yep. So what would, would happen if we have like a rectangle outside group and you first select the group as the, the parent object and then you select a rectangle again with the data behave? Uh, this is, is this what we're doing here? Or um, if we have a, like extra rectangle element outside the group? Outside group. And then we would select. Well, if we don't, if we have a rectangle element outside of a group, um, and, and we map, like it always depends on what you're selecting at the top level, right? Um, and so here I'm selecting on bar groups. And so I, and I wouldn't ever get a rectangle in this selection that is yeah, not part of it. this group does mean that the extra rectangle don't have a, doesn't have data? This doesn't have data. Like if I just add a rectangle up here in the SVG, um, I copy one over. So if I add a rectangle here, this will not match the first selection, right? You will see this element, uh, you see it here, and if I click run now, it will simply stay here. And you now cannot see it because it's uh, occluded by the other element, but if you look at the DOM here, we will actually see that there's two different rectangles. And so this is like, brings me to another, uh, like, now I can see it again, and it, if you like pay close attention, you see that it still stays there even if as the, the other one fits in. Yep. So when you select something, um, afterwards, if you call select on it again, it's, the scope is only the previous selection, right? Uh, yes. So you're not, like, you're selecting within the subset of the DOM, yes. Okay, great. Uh, I think that was a good discussion. Um, so, one thing that is a problem, like now I've always picked very convenient data sets that work perfe perfectly for screen coordinates, like 300, 400, and so on. Like I have 400 pixels, and then I see a big bar. Usually you don't have data like this. Your data is gonna be like either like between zero and one, or it's gonna be like very big that doesn't really map to screen coordinates. So we need to think about a transformation from data space to screen space. And so here I have a data set with 0 0.3, 0 0.01, and 1.5. <coughs> and if we directly map that to a screen space, um, this is what it looks like, which is not a particularly helpful uh, data visualization, right? Um, so what we need to do is we need to find like a transfer function that <coughs> takes the input data and maps it to our screen space. So what we look for is this function that maps an input data set D to a derived data set D, uh, D prime, um, where, where this function uh, is chosen in such a way that D prime corresponds to sensible screen coordinates. Um, that is also true for colors. So if I were to have like uh, an RGB colors, if I have a scale, uh, or if I want to map from like from from white to red, uh, then I had I, or from Zero of zero to 255. Like if I had that in the zero to 255 scale, that would be fine. But if I have like data values like 0 0.1 and I want to map that to this color space number, uh, I also need to have such a transfer function. So it's not only pixels, but it's like we have an input domain and we have an output range. And the output range can be pixel space, it can be color space, or whatever. Um, and so, what would be a simple way of doing that? Exactly. So we could simply create a function here that scale, that takes our input and we understand something about our input and we say take the input multiplied by 500. 
So um, the interesting part here is that we don't use the D directly, but instead use the scale function. Um, so that's a way of fixing this, and if we do that, uh, we see that it works. Um, so we could simply be satisfied with our great solution, and we can change that mapping function, of course, and then it's going to look differently, um, but the same data. And so this is like where we can choose um, how, how our data should appear. Um, so this is convenient and great, but uh, D3 does a lot of really powerful things with scales. So there's a couple of different things that you could want to do to scales like this. You could want to map to color space. You could want to map to like a logarithmic scale. You could want to map to power scales. You could want to do discrete scales. You could want to put in like categorical data and get positions out of that and so on. All of these are scaling problems. And so um, therefore, um, like, there's also temporal data that you could hand, want to be able to handle, which is really tough to like, uh, convert between days and months and so on. Um, all of these things, um, and you need, like, you have the raw data of these different types, and you need to transform it into either like screen space or color uh, and so on. And so D3 provides this pretty powerful set of scale operations, um, which you should really look at. Is this like here is the documentation for it? Like, this is the linear scale. And so D3 provides like a variety of, of different scales. So it has continuous scales, uh, linear, power, log, uh, identity, time, sequential scales, which are very similar to continuous scales, quantile scale, scales, quantile scales, threshold scales, and ordinal scales. So all of these scales are available in D3. Um, so here is how we use those. Um, what we do is we have, like again, the data set that doesn't work well in screen coordinates. And then we define d3.scale linear. This is the function that creates such a scale for us. And by the way, this is like a slight subtle difference between um, d3 version 4 and d3 version 3. That used to be d3.scale.linear. And then now they have flattened the namespace, so it's d3.scale linear. Um, so uh, we define a new scale here, we tell it our domain, and the domain is the input data space. And so here we say the domain goes from zero, which is what we assume in this data set, um, to d3.max the data. So here we take the maximum of the data um, for the extent of that data set. And then we define the range, which is our output space from zero to 700. So these are essentially, what we do here is we map zero to zero, and we map the maximum to 700, okay? Um, so now we have this, this scale, and the scale is actually a function. Like, we, we treat it as a variable, but as we learned in the JavaScript lesson, uh, variables can also be functions. And so what we do then here, where the interesting bit is, where we define the width, we, instead of like doing the D directly, we call the scale, X scale of D. And that gives us now the correct value. And so if we do that, it looks just as before. Um, and so no big surprises here. Yep? So for the range, uh, for our upper bound, if we pass it, for example, mean no bit, um, is it always, are we always going to have pretty much like a full screen? Yep. Exactly. So you can pass in like uh, you can pass in a function here or another variable. Yes, you can do that. Um, so here's an example for a log scale. And for log scales, we have to change. Um, I want to move this, and then I also cannot use a domain of zero because uh, log of zero is undefined. So I have a domain of zero. Uh, 0 0.01, and now if I run this, I get a log scale, and you see that this small element here looks a lot bigger because we have used the log transformation. Um, and so we could use this for power scale, or we could we could do discrete scales, binning, and so on. So anything in here uh, will be possible. And so that's pretty convenient. You could even like put in put in a switch here, and say transform between linear and logarithmic scale. Um, it's it's also easy to do. Um, Okay, um, yeah, so like I've always used the d3max function. Um, it's like pretty simple. It simply returns a max of the array. Uh, there is a little bit more that I'll talk about later for the d3max function. Um, and so then you could also have 
like a not well-defined domain. Um, you could have a domain that, for example, streaming data, and you might get in like one data value, or you might say, I have this one outlier that is just so much bigger that it ruins my scale for everything else. Um, so you could have situations where you don't want to define your domain to be the maximum here. And so here I'm manually, just for like to demonstrate this, I'm manually defining the domain from 0 to 1.5, but we can see that the biggest element here is 2. Okay? And so what happens here is if like I'm, this is my, like the, essentially the gray rectangle illustrates um, the, the, our screen coordinates that I'm using, and if I do that, um, I get this bar that exceeds um, the, the coordinates here. So what, what this function does, is if it is defined, uh, for this bigger value, it simply gives you the corresponding bigger value. Um, sometimes this is what you want. Many times you rather want to do something like clamping here. And so I can run this clamp function, and if I clamp the data, everything that is... That was not the intention. Ah, uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, if I run this clamp here, we can see that every value that is bigger uh, than the maximum uh, than, the, than the maximum defined in the domain is being clamped. So this should be done cautiously um, because here you would need to indicate that um, the value is actually bigger. So you would need to, for example, put in the star in the annotation or somehow indicate that the scale is broken, uh, change the color, and so on. So you have to treat that separately. But you can use this clamping to do that. Is there anything that returns uh, which items are clamped? Uh, no, but that, that should be easy to check for right sure. here. Yeah. So there's no automatic, uh, or none of the no at least. Okay, um, so like I've, so far I've only done bar charts, no colors. Um, it is actually possible to do colors in D3. Um, so here is an example that uses a redundant encoding, positive and negative values, uh, like a symmetric bar chart for positive values to the right in blue. Um, and we have a saturation, like we start with a gray, um, and increase the saturation of blue as the, uh, as the data set gets bigger. So you can see we have these light blue, light red, and then the dark red long bars and the dark blue long bars um, here. So like we have a redundant encoding of the length of these bars, um, of the position, um, uh, uh, of the tip of the bars, and of the color here. So how do we do that? Um, here's the data set. Like it's, it's a mix of float, floating point values um, that are between like plus 1.3 and minus 1.2. Um, so we define our x scale, the position scale, as the minimum of the data and the maximum of the data. Um, and so then define our range from 0 to 800. And so the minimum here like, would be some negative value that would be 0, and the maximum would be a positive value that would be 800. And then we do the same for the color scale. We say like exactly the same definition, uh, d3 min, uh, d3 max. What we do here, though, is we provide an additional point here. Like, we have three values in the domain. We have a minimum, a zero, and a maximum. Um, and so, like, if I wanted to improve my performance of this code, I could actually have saved uh, this to a variable, but anyways. Um, so what this does then is, uh, here I'm not defining the range in pixel space, as I did here but I'm defining the range in these CSS named colors. So from dark red to light gray to steel blue. And then D3 will find the appropriate, appropriate interpolation between dark red and light gray and light gray and steel blue in the minimum to zero between those two and uh, zero to maximum between those two. And then if I... Uh, like here are a couple of like for, for treating the for positioning these values, like I'm setting the x uh, position as the minimum of zero or d. So if d is negative, x it starts at the negative value of the rectangle. Um, if d is positive, um, it starts at zero. Um, then for uh, width, it is simply the absolute of um, the scale of d minus the scale of zero. 
This is just so that I can handle the positive and the negative values uh, properly. And then for the color scale, I'm simply saying st style fill is color scale of D. And that is all. Like now I have, I get like, this is past the proper uh, color scale, and this is what, how we get um, this example. And so if you look at the output in the DOM inspector, we'll see that we have the fill here defined as RGB values. Um, and these are, of course, different for every of those rectangles. X scale of zero, in this case, will give you, like, it's not, um, X scale of zero is not, doesn't map to a pixel coordinate of zero, but it actually maps to this position right here. So X scale of zero gives us the baseline of this chart here. And X scale of, or color scale of zero would give us this gray. Um, color scale of the minimum value would give us a dark red, color scale of the maximum value would give us a dark red. Okay, any questions about this? And so the, these color scales are pretty powerful. You can do many different things, and there's also predefined color scales. I'll later show you an example for an ordinal color scale. Okay, um, so what we've done, with the exception of this level bar chart, we haven't really like, looked at what the data really means. And we've seen that like, we can transform the size of each of these bars arbitrarily, um, how we read these charts is by drawing axes and by drawing legends. And so here, I'll show you how to draw axes properly. Um, just as a note for a design perspective, it's really important to label and put axes in your charts because otherwise it is becoming um, pretty useless. And that's like a common mistake in visualization papers, not so much in uh, the news because people care more about the data. But if you're, if you're hacking away on a technique, uh, and only think about, oh, this looks great, uh, make sure that your data is readable, and so you can do this with, with axes. And so these three, like, axes are, if you have to do them manually, they're really a pain to do, because uh, you can imagine that finding the right intervals is not so great, not so easy, and then doing everything here, like an axis is a pretty complex construct, uh, doing all the tick marks and, and, and the text labels and so on, so axes are pretty, like, hard to draw manually. And D3, fortunately, also provides functions for drawing axes. Um, that also makes it really simple. And so this is like the minimum example um, of, of uh, the this, this same bar chart with axes. Um, and so if you look at this, we can see a couple of things that are not so great, right? Uh, we see we have one data value that is 1.21. And therefore, we have this like not so pretty uh, solution here. And then here to the right, it is actually clipped. Um, we cannot read this label anymore, uh, or there is no label anymore. So the sort of label we've got here, we don't really know what the maximum value is, and so on. So this axis, while it is great that we have an axis here, there is ways of optimizing this, um, which is then going to be the next example. But first, let's look at what, how we do this that it actually um, appears. Um, so we have the data. Um, here I'm defining the min and the max. I'm using the scales. And so scales and axes, as you could imagine, they have a very symbiotic relationship because the, scale, the axes are um, based on the scale. Here I'm defining the axis. I'm saying d3.axis bottom. And so there's four different ways um, like of creating an axis. Axis bottom, axis top, axis left, axis right. Um, that essentially define where the text goes in relationship to the tick marks. And so the axis bottom would have the like the line here on top and the tick marks in the, to in, in the text at the bottom. Um, and then here is the important part. I'm assigning the scale to the axis. Um, so x axis dot scale and put in the scale. So now they, those two are in sync. And for example, if I ever wanted to update a scale, and um, then I would simply have to update the axis and the axis would correspondingly also update. And so here is like just the um, same stuff as we did before. And this here is the interesting part. So here I'm appending to the SVG, to the top level element, I'm appending a group element um, as like the container for that axis, so that this axis is uh, properly wrapped. And then I simply call 
the x-axis. And this is how D3 generates this axis for us. Uh, and so this is just the output then. We, are, in this case, haven't positioned this. It's just appended to the top of the DOM. So we have this occlusion here um, and all of the not so nice properties, but it's an axis and it works. Any questions about this? Yep. So um, if you change the axis bottom to axis right, it flips it so it's a vertical axis. Uh, yep. the side. Is there a way to leave it that horizontal axis and just move those labels up next to the tick marks? Yeah. Um, I could simply say axis top. So, let's try it. And so, well, it's outside of the SVG uh, in this case, um, because it's like the baseline is what is defined by the position of the axis. But if we were to look at this, now the, like if we saw it, if we transition it down, we would see that the labels are, ups, out, uh, are on the outside of the axis. Is that what you meant? No, I mean, have the ticks still coming down, but rather than having a tick down in the label here, have the tick down in the label here? You can do that. Uh, it is custom styling. So you can style these axes pretty, like there's pretty sophisticated ways of styling these axes. Um, you can position them as you like. Um, I don't have the code in my head. I would have to look it's up. It's not easy. It's it's not not it's not hard, uh, but it's like I've, I've, for example I can show you here. Uh, well, it's actually not quite this right example, but yeah, it's possible. Uh, it's also not terribly hard. It's extra code you have to manually do it. So D three does a lot of assumptions about how how to render this axis, um, and I'll show you in a second how you can influence that. So assuming we didn't have a scale function, how would you tie the axis to our data? Not. That depends on the scale function. So it's independent of the data, but it's really yep. dependent on the Exactly. Any other questions? Um, this is also like a slight change compared to D3 version 3. Like if the defaults, if you look at on the last year's version, this is the same website, but for that I used with D3.3. So here, like the old axes in D3 version 3 were like only very basic, and so you had to do more styling um, manually. Um, now D3.4 is smarter, has a couple of better, nicer defaults, um, which, which makes it more convenient. Still, we need to like do a couple of things to these axes. So first, I can here I'm just showing it's not actually like ugly um, in terms of how the CSS is, but I can simply um, take like this dot axis is um, this class selector for uh, the group that I will manually assign later. Um, here I'm, I'm saying all the paths and the lines should be shown in forest green. I should have a stroke with a one pixel. The text should be not sans serif as it was before, but serif, and it should be a font size 40, 14 pixels. And then what I also want to do is, like I'm rendering here a background, I'm positioning this properly. Open this up in a new page. I'm rendering a background, I'm positioning this properly, I move the axis down, I change the color here, and you also notice that it goes from minus 4 to 1.4, so everything is like nicely rounded and um, and like visually pleasing, and that's like um, the interesting bit here is that we have this um, these like um, nicely rounded um, axis tick marks. And so, how do we do that? Um, there's a couple of tricks that we, we apply here. So first, the styling. Um, the styling itself isn't really super interesting, but you can do it. Um, and then, what I'm also sh showing you in this example for the first time is how to handle padding in, in D3 properly. So we define a height and a width, and then we define a padding. Um, and so then we take SVG, um, set it like dynamically for the first time in code here, to a width plus two times the padding and a height plus two times the padding. So now the, um, the SVG is a little bit bigger than our actual render area. Just so for illustration, I'm rendering um, a rectangle in the background in gray, um, as you can see here, um, adds the position, I'm translating it by padding, 
so that it is actually exactly corresponds with the drawing area. Uh, and then we get into the familiar territory where we have the data. We, in this case, um, we have a, a spacing defined. Um, we have the minimum values, maximum values. We define the scale. Um, and so here is an important piece of code. The nice function here gives us round values for our scales. Um, and that is not only for the axis, but for the scales themselves, right? So what this does is if I have some like 1.21, um, it takes, it rounds it up to the next value. So it's going to be 1.3, or in this case, even 1.4. So D3 is trying to be smart if you do this nice on um, modifying your domain or your, um, your range uh, or your domain actually um, such that it's nicely like mapped out to the screen space. Um, I'm not doing this for the color scale. I'm only doing this for the, uh, for the X scale. Is there a mean function? Uh, what? The opposite. The mean. <laughs> mean is the default. <laughs> um, you can uh, parameterize this nice function, though. There, you can put in how many tick marks you want to create and so on. Um, or there's other ways of parameterizing the nice function. Tick marks is actually part of an access property. Um, and so here, for example, <coughs> how I could change the number of ticks. So I'm actually pretty happy with the number of ticks that we have here. Um, but if I wanted to change the number of ticks, let's, let's just look at what happens if I remove the nice. You see we have again this like ugly double tick here for one point, minus 1.21, and then here we have one for 1 1.3. Um, and if I add the nice back in, it goes to these nice ranges. Nice makes the ranges nice. Um, so um, then the ticks here, like by default, D3 assumes a number of ticks, but you can manipulate this, and you should treat this more as like suggestions, uh, because if I click, oh, I forgot the column. Um, so like, we can make it do this. Uh, of course, not very usable. Um, we could do like, I think 30 ticks works okay for this particular example. So that is readable. Um, notice that this is not exact. Um, so D3 is gonna take this number and gonna try to roughly match it, but it gives priority to, like it doesn't take uh, your domain and divides it by the number of ticks you give it, but it, it tries to like find a compromise between the number you put in and what it can divide with round and nice numbers. So if you count this, this is not exactly 30, and this wasn't exactly 40 earlier. Um, what else is interesting here? Um, well, I am saying, I'm telling the G, um, it is of class axis. This is what I'm using in the CSS selectors at the top to um, style this. Um, and then I am transforming it um, and sim simply putting it at the bottom here. Um, and so like, now I have created this chart with the nice axis. Any questions about this? Okay. Um, so this is now like one big example for the rest of the class that has a couple of new aspects. Um, so we will work like up to now we've gone, yep. Is it possible to change the orientation of the labels of the axis? Yes, um, but I don't know in like now from the top of my head how. Like you just have to look up on the access documentation. Generally, this like uh, you should like I'm always trying to link like every every link that you see here is to the API documentation and, and uh, I'm like D3 is like a gigantic library with many 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 thousand functions. Um, and so you should always like think, okay, what do we want to achieve? And then look at the API documentation of what, how is it implemented, how can I change this, and so on. Like I've used many things myself, um, but I probably have forgotten um, more things than I still remember. But it's easy to go back, it's easy to find in the documentation how to achieve something in particular. And, but you, you can, you're for completely free on choosing the orientation and so on of the text and the styling. You could even do that with CSS, but it's not going to be automatically uh, super nice to read. Okay, so in this one example, um, 
we're looking at a more complex data structure first. We're not like up to now, I have only passed the numerical arrays, but usually you have like the data is in some context, you have a name for a data item, you have multiple data items associated with a specific um, unit. Um, um, so we look at how we access uh, these data objects, we look at how we sort the data uh, dynamically based on different attributes. Um, we um, look at how we properly, like we've done some padding, but there's better ways of doing this, so how we properly deal with padding in an SVG, um, how to use a scale with bands to evenly space the bars. So up to now, we, I have usually taken like I multiplied by something because I knew how many bars to expect um, to position the bars, but there's better ways of doing this with a scale, uh, with band scales. How we update the scale, uh, in this case the band scale also. Um, how to ensure object consistency for transitions with the key function of the data mapping. So like I mentioned this earlier in this class. Um, by default, like we simply, this is if we don't define a key function, uh, we simply take the position of the DOM element and map it to the uh, data elements. But if we define a key function, we can actually um, control exactly how things transition between different states. Um, and then how to use object notation to define many attributes at the same time. Um, so this is the code. I'll walk you through this, but I'll first show you what this thing can do. So we have we start out with a scale. I click on the run button, and then we have uh, information about products in the grocery store. Uh, we have apples, bananas, plums, bread, cereals, beer, and wine in metric tons in this case. Um, and so we can see that we have um, a couple of different data attributes here. So we have the labels, like which product is it? Uh, as you can see, there's also a, um, a, a category, like um, is it spirits, is it um, like groceries, or is it fruit? This is what drives the color coding. Um, and then we have how many tons of this particular product is being sold at a supermarket. This is of course made up data. Probably would never be this big in Utah. <laughs> Ice cream would be for <laughs> Ice cream and soda would be great over there. Um, and so what we can do here now is to switch between how we sort this chart. So by default, it's, it's sorted by type. Um, we can sort it by uh, product names. So now we have an alphabetical sorting for alpha, uh, apples, banana, beer, bread. Um, and then we, have, we can sort it by uh, the volume of sales. Um, so there is like a couple of things that go on in this chart, um, and we'll now go through that. Okay. So um, we use two additional non-standard D3 libraries in this example. Uh, this is how you would include them. The selection, the, the selection multi, um, is for. Um, setting multiple attributes uh, based on an object. Um, and the color brewer here is um, for um, categorical color scales. Um, for D3 uh, version 4 now actually comes also with um, nice default color scales, but the color brewer scales are still available uh, here. So we, we, I'm still using them. Um, and so here is our drop down box. Um, we had this in, in the HTML lecture. It has an ID drop down. We have the three different options. Um, and then here's our data. And you can see this is an array of objects. Um, <coughs> so we have like product, tons, and type, apples, and numerical value, and fruit. Um, and so like these are essentially labels, these are numerical values, and these are like classes, ordinal values. Uh, fruit, fruit, grocery, grocery, alcohol, alcohol. Um, then here we define those types, I could also like extract it dynamically, but in this case I was just lazy. Um, I'm defining those types. Um, I am uh, like I'm ex here. I'm retrieving the max of the values um, for the x scale for the length of the bars. And so this is what I mentioned earlier. When we'll talk a little bit more about the max function, because you can actually also pass in an accessor function for the max, because it wouldn't really know how to compare those objects, right? So you need to tell it which field in the object it has to look at. So I'm saying, okay, if you compare, like if you try to find the max, use this function to do the comparison and use the tons within each of these objects to find the maximum. Um, 
Here I'm setting up margins. Like you could, like here I have top, right, bottom, left uh, in an object, 20, 30, 30, 40. Um, I am setting up the width of the drawing area, uh, or the, um, in this case it's 800 when it minus the margins. Um, the height is 500 minus the margins. Um, and then I first, like, this is kind of like um, separated into a couple of parts now. We have here the basic SVG. Um, then we have the sorting function and the event handling. And then down here we set up the scales. And then here, like, we set up the basic, like, assign the axis. And down here, in the execute function, we handle everything that can be updated. So everything that happens before the execute is if I reload this, everything that uh, that is rendered here is this done before the execute, and so the execute also serves as an update. And of course, this is like just my personal convention, right? So this could be you could call this function whatever you like. Um, okay, let's look at this again. Um, what is interesting here? Um, well. I'm selecting the SVG element and defining, like, essentially, again, um, the width as the actual drawing width plus the paddings to the left, the height as the actual drawing width plus the paddings to the pot, bottom and top. Um, then I'm appending, like, one big G element to it and transforming it by margin left and margin top. And so what I did is I essentially took everything and shifted my coordinate system down uh, by the margins. Um, here is how you use the D3's event handler. There has been a couple of implicit uses uh, of the event handler in previous examples, but we haven't really talked about it. Um, like we, you remember that like in the, in the um, JavaScript uh, or in the, the D3 um, and DOM API, we talked about how, how to react on these event handlers, but we use the standard API. Um, D3 also provides ways of doing this, so here I'm simply selecting uh, the drop DOM, so I, I get this data, uh, I get this DOM element which corresponds to the drop DOM box, and say on change call this function here. Okay, so that's pretty simple. Um, the bit that you have to know is, um, in this case we need to go back and understand what is the value of this element, um, and so we could um, simply go in and say d3 select drop down um, give me this specific node and then um, give me the value but I can also access the event uh, that was triggered here and I can say d3 dot event and this is, that is, this is only defined in the, in, in the context of an event handler um, and then I can say what is the source element of this event and then give me the value and so now active is um, is exactly this value of the drop down box here so one of those, like type, product, or tonnage, depending on what has been selected. Um, and so then um, I am running a sort uh, function on the array, on this array of objects. And again, uh, here I don't want to just sort it based on some value, but here I need to implement the logic of what to sort by. So here we had this example. If I here click run, then now I want to define what to use for the sorting. Like if I say tonnage, I really want to sort by the tonnage. And so this is how we realize this in this case. We, we now have like active is the active value, so we switch for active um, in the sort function. Um, and if like we, we always need to find like define a compare function, we talked about how, how to do this. So we have an A and a B and we can do a lexicographic comparison or a comparison based on values. And so for product or type, we want to do a lexicographic comparison. So we simply follow through to the type and, and go into this, um, into this case statement for both of these cases, for product or type. And so here we have simply uh, the lexicographic comparison. And for tonnage, we simply return b.tons minus a.tons. So what happens if I do this? Exactly, so we would get a, a reversed <coughs> we have the tonnage, we now sort it from like to, um, bottom to top. So here is where we control this, this sorting criteria. Okay, then we initialize the, the scale, 
then here we initialize this color scale. And so here we're using an ordinal color scale again, uh, or not again, we're using it for the first time. Um, and so we put in as domain, we put in these types. And the types, remember, these were the product types that are defined up here. So this is grocery, fruit, alcohol. And so this is the domain, these three distinct states. Um, and then the range is output a color. Like here I'm, I'm defining this color rule accent scale, um, the fourth version of that, that has exactly the right number of values. Um, so I'm taking the types, in this case, and assigning them to a unique color. Um, and this is then baked into this color scale function. Um, here is where, it, like any questions so far about this? Um, here is where I um, define the, the scale band, which is like a pretty convenient function to position these bars, because otherwise I always have to think about where do I put my bar, how wide is it, um, and how much spacing do I create between those bars. And so by using these scale bands, um, I can then define a range, which is simply the height here, from zero to height, and the padding between them and the padding of 0 0.1. And so if you look at the documentation here, there is a good illustration of, of which of these properties you can define. So this is the overall range. Here you have an outer padding. Um, then you have the step size, which is like from here, plus the width, plus an inner padding. And then you have the bandwidth, which is essentially you can then use to define your bars. Um, so like if you ever get confused, I think this figure is great at explaining what the band scale stuff, uh, the scale band does. Um, the x-axis is like uh, we put it at the bottom. Uh, we set it to the x scale. We do this um, appending of the axis as we have done before, and now it gets interesting. Here um, is the update. Um, uh, here is the like where, where all of the changes happen if we switch between the different uh, sorting criteria. Um, the Y scale, and this is interesting because the Y scale here depends um, on, on what you have selected. Um, so we're setting the domain here dynamically. And so this is interesting because the data, um, whenever you repeat this, the data is going to be in a different order, right? When you have called a sort function, um, it is going to be in a different order. And if you don't do this within here, it will not change the order. And so you need to do it within the execute function so that you get the updated sorted, sorted data, um, the uh, updated sorted data item. Um, and then we simply um, create a group. Uh, well, we select based on the groups. Uh, we return, uh, we return um, the data value, the uh, product name as the key in this case. <coughs> Um, and so this is the critical part here about the key function that we haven't used yet uh, for the data mapping. So we've only done dot data and then pass in the data array. But here we tell, um, we tell D3 what to use to uniquely identify a product. Um, so we tell it, take the D dot product as our unique identifier, which is the name of the product. And so therefore, like if we, for example, were to change the like, tonnage of how many bananas we sell, um, if we want to update this for another month, it would still associate it with banana because we have used the, the product uh, here as the key function for the data binding. And so this is how the sorting like, really happens in the end and how it knows where to put what. Um, so this, this can be a little bit tricky to get your head around to understand all the implications of that. Um, we do the basic, like the standard uh, enter, like we create a G element and so on. I think this isn't super interesting. Let me pick out the interesting parts. Well, here we do, um, um, like here, this is all text placement. Um, how we like text anchor it at the end. So what we do is, um, we when we render those layables, like I, I don't want to, like I wanted them to align nicely here, right? I didn't want to align them on the left. And so like, to do that, I could either try to like, find the position that works for all of these text levels, but what I'm doing instead here is I am setting the position of the right side of the text and then set the, the defining the text anchor in, with the CSS property to the end. Um, so therefore, we get this nice alignment without any complex calculations of where that should start. 
Um, then we have an alignment baseline, uh, and this is, takes care of the fading in. Um, then to this uh, bar groups enter, we append the rectangles. Um, here is the interesting bit about, uh, uh, about uh, defining the width of these rectangles. So by simply taking like the width here, and those are scaled automatically. So if I added two, like if I added two data items here, um, I wouldn't have to change anything and the width of the bar would simply be dynamically updated because I'm using this um, band scale and by asking for the band scale's bandwidth we know exactly how high these bars are. Um, here I use the color scale to, uh, to color by type um, and anything else that is interesting here? Well that is the most interesting piece. So this, this creates this um, this chart where we have this interactivity, um, where we sort by keys, where we have the event handling, um, and all of these things are done in kind of the way that they are intended with D3. So this could be like your big reference example for your work. Okay, that leaves us with four seconds, which is a good end point. Thank you.